Hey, good evening. This is Wallace Gated Bradley, and I'm the host of the Bradley Report. I'm also the president of United and Peace, Inc. We got a very interesting show this evening. We're going to talk about someone that everybody praying would run for governor. We're going to talk about what you already know about. Your check is in the mail. President Biden signed the bill that the House and Senate put together for stimulus and to help individuals with COVID and how they can get their vaccines and how you can get money that you need and everything. The $1.9 trillion bill. For all Americans, whether you're Republican, Democrat, Black, White, Christian, Muslim, don't care. If you're an American, that $1.9 trillion is going to help you. Something else that's very key. We're going to talk about this violence that's in our community. I know you've heard about 15 people getting shot at a party on 6,700 or other South Chicago. 15 million. I mean, 15 individuals get shot one time. At the same time, rather. Two of them died. And it wasn't a police officer that shot all of them. It were one or more African Americans that shot these 15 people and two of them died. Black on black crime, but understand this was more important. That is being known as a terrorist attack. A terrorist attack. Because the individual had to hate someone that bad that he would shoot up a place and other innocent people would get shot. We're going to talk about that. We also going to talk about the importance of eradicating syn systemic corporate systemic racism that McDonald's is engaging in against black people, not minorities, black people, African Americans. We've started, as I'm sure you're aware, this 90-day peaceful educational protest against McDonald's corporate office because of how they have done African-American franchisees. You're going to hear about that. We started at the corporate office on February 22nd. Then they went to Memphis. And then we're going to be in Atlanta on April the 1st. And because of your help, through social media, helping us to educate our people, elected officials, African Americans, elected officials, African American religious leaders, African American civil rights leaders, as well as corporate America, about what McDonald's is doing. It reminds me of apartheid. When we want to let the world know that what South Africa was doing because of their systemic racist policies, 
Everyone start divesting to eradicate apartheid. And stop you from investing in South Africa. We got the power as the people to do the same thing to McDonald's and other corporations. But the show was brought together because of the producer of this show. Someone that helped me get the verifiable documented facts to present to you on this show. And that's none other than the chairman of United Peace Inc. My wife, Terry Marsh Bradley. And the reason we're able to bring this show to you is because of the help of Brother Omari. So Amari, with that, I want to say to God be the glory. That's my story. Let's go to work. If you pick up that gun and you fire that gun, anyone that get harmed from you firing that gun, that's an innocent bystander. We're asking the community, ostracize them, push them out, don't let them hide anywhere, don't support them, and let law enforcement do their job. The code is this. If you pick up that gun to solve your problem, I'm not endorsing violence. I'm saying you're violating the code if you discharge that weapon and innocent people get shot or killed, especially a, a child or an elderly person, and the community must uphold that code. He got a shoe shine. The reason that it worked in the 90s, because everyone was a part of it. Kids, women, elderly, was off limits. You didn't touch them. Didn't touch them. Got ostracized from the community, pushing you out of the community, not supporting you in the community, or protecting you in the community, so that law enforcement can do their job by apprehending and the Cook County State's Attorney can do her job by making sure that you get a fair prosecution. This is so that there's no retaliation in the community because you discharge or you fire that weapon at your attendant or attendant party. We all got to come together. Those of you, my name is Wallace Peter Bradley. I'm the Urban Translator. I'm the President of United Peace People. We all got to come together to let it be known that black lives matter everywhere. Regardless if the police shoot somebody that's black, it means twice as much to our community when someone black is shooting someone black. With at least eight children under the age of 10 shot in the city in just two weeks, some are asking if that code still carries any weight. There's something that we got to do. Gator catches up with some friends on Calumet. That one year old that got killed. And his conversations of late have focused on kids getting shot. He says the rule still applies. We as men got to put it down and say that still exists and never left. We all got a responsibility. We all got a responsibility, man. But it never left. I'm going to call out to all the brothers. You know what we do. Put the word on the street that this is no longer tolerated. Men and homes work together and we know how it works. We've been able to help individuals turn themselves in or the community, kick them out for law enforcement to come to rest. Now is the time 
just like it was a video from Miss Frazier, and let everybody know about the awakening of George Floyd. Somebody got a media, a video, or we need to use our video to stop this senseless violence. And I believe that vengeance belongs to the Lord. And with that, I want to say, to God be the glory. And that's my story. You know, as you may be aware, they caught the individual. They killed two of his family members in Riverdale and he was on the run. That's a, and that's because of the rest. Yes, that's because of the will of the, no, want to go back to the investigation of the 15 people that got shot. Right there, yes sir. You know, they caught that individual that shot his family members, two kids, two young adults. Brother and a sister. It was a friend of mine's grandchildren. And he thought he was getting away, but they finally caught him. This story here that I'm about to show you. And I'm going to say to God be the glory that they apprehended him. Because he had a little baby in the car and he dropped the baby off. But I can't say it's another story. Then again, I guess I can. There's another story of many stories of black on black violence and how the community is coming together, working with law enforcement to help apprehend the individuals that are responsible for this crime. And one of the things that's gonna happen, you're hearing it here. For all you young brothers that's in the various different street organizations, man, you better stop with the violence. Pay attention to what they're doing to the Proud Boys, all the way up where they're investigating some of the congressmen that was inciting those individuals that attacked the Capitol. And they put that terrorism or terrorist tag on them. They're about to make it a law about domestic terrorism. And they use hate crimes in what they did. They're going to do that to you young brothers in the community that's engaging in this senseless shootings and killings and violence. And they're going to make it a hate crime because they're going to say that person had to hate someone that bad that they would jeopardize the lives and the well-being 
of others just to get at that person that they hate. Because they're saying you can't love individuals and shoot them. That's the second large shooting within a year in Chicago. Remember the last shooting like that? It was at a funeral home. I believe it was on 71st. And they're showing you where they got technology. Technology. Where they can catch you. With this bouncing off this tower, that tower, everybody got uh, the ring alarms on the, on the uh, homes and apartments and you driving past and you're running past and you're talking and don't know that every step you're taking is being recorded. The cameras that they got in our community now, they're saying they're going to give you a ticket if you go six miles over the speed limit. Don't think them cameras ain't working tracking. They coming at you. You're seeing how they grabbing and catching those senseless individuals. This, this is what I want to show you right here. It says 15 people. Bring it down right here. It says Chicago police. Yeah, this is it right here, Connor. Mari. It says Chicago police investigate possible gang nexus in the shooting that killed two and wounded 13. Could you hit that, that video right there? We have Bad to tackle to why people are literally using guns to settle petty disputes. At least 15 people were shot, two of them killed at a late night party on Chicago's south side. Nate Rogers has been speaking with police and community activists about this tragedy, and he's live for us tonight outside of police headquarters. Nate. That's right, Don and Corey. Police have been working leads all day long trying to identify the shooter or shooters involved. They're also trying to connect with all of the folks that attended this party. According to one source, many folks just randomly showed up at area hospitals asking for treatment after being shot. This was the chaotic scene, 5 a.m. 67th in South Chicago. Folks on stretchers, police trying to calm an agitated crowd. 39-year-old Lionel Darling and 30-year-old Rainisha Dotson now dead. Several of the uh, witnesses who were wounded are still in surgery and have yet to be interviewed, so more to come as far as uh, any kind of motive. The mass shooting occurred at a pop-up event inside this building, which had been converted into a bar and party area. At least 15 people shot. Their ages range from 20 to 44 years old. At one point, it may have been an old lounge uh, that is, uh, you know, obviously converted just for the pop-up party. These people... They don't have any type of training. They pick up these guns and settle these disputes and just start shooting everywhere. They never shoot each other. Reports indicate the shooting may have been gang related. Community activist Jamal Green says the altercation ensued over a petty dispute. Most of these people that were shot were literally just partying, trying to have a good time. Four guns were recovered at the scene. The number of shooters not yet released. Now, you may recall this is the second mass shooting here in Chicago in less than a year. In July, 15 people again were shot outside of that funeral home in the Auburn Gresham neighborhood. Now, as far as today's shooting, police again still working to track down the shooter involved. Um, at least a dozen folks still remain in the hospital. Their conditions range from stable to serious. We're live at Chicago Police Headquarters. I'm Nate Rogers, Fox 32 News. You know, I'm glad Brother Jamal Green and I saw Brother Eric, two community activists. We worked together. We both, all three of us, are purposefully focused on ending senseless violence, shootings and killings within our community. 
And we all ask individuals if your name ringing, turn yourself in. Create yourself. Because when we try to get rid of systemic racial racism, systemic racism across the board and everything that's happening from schools to jobs to contracts and when we Say we got to find laws to make sure that the officers that commit violence against us as a people and they keep getting away. They always throw this truth back at us. What about all that black on black crime? You know what I mean? What about all that black on black crime? So we got to be around against violence and its totality, regardless if it's the police doing it, and definitely if it's black on black, so that they can't come back with us as an excuse for police officers getting away with murder. And it's being covered up by police officers. Because they have a code of silence. And then try to say the gangs are doing it. The gangs are, look, look, look how them Negroes killing one another. Look how them blacks killing one another. And I know the community is fed up with it. And I'm here to tell you. As a former gang member. Former enforcer of a gang, but I was enforcing the peace. When the community is fed up with you, there's nowhere for you to hide. They're going to get you. And anybody that's supporting you is going to get caught up in it. So family members, the streets are talking, everybody's talking. Name of the game is telephone, telegram, tell a Negro. Everybody talking. I heard videos that everybody had their phones doing because everybody was dancing. All on Facebook and you're hearing the shots. And you're hearing the people scream and you it partying. The individual whose loved ones got shot or killed don't say what brought it about. And just like those carjackers got caught when the community, when the 19th Ward, 34th Ward, firemen, police officers, fraternities, sororities, Masonic Order, Black, white, Hispanics, all of them came together even if they weren't talking to one another to say this no longer will be tolerated here. And all four of them got caught. That's why I opened up my show with the code. Because that's what the code is all about. We're going to keep it moving. There's a young lady by the name of, used to be the Attorney General, Miss Lisa Madigan. Brother Amari, can you pull that story up, Lisa Madigan? Right there. Can you bring it up a little bit? Hey, right there. Come down, son. I'm going to get the headline of it. No, no, I'm sorry. Go up, go up, go up. Right there. The question within the state of Illinois, especially in the African-American community, 
Lisa Madigan for a governor. Now the statement is a question. But the statement is everyone knows that she's a woman with integrity. She's someone with ethical fortitude. She's someone that care about fairness for all Illinois. Republican, Democrat, black, white, Christian, Muslim, Jewish, Hispanics, Asians, young and old. And the reason that her name has come up in the community, mainly because her father is no longer the speaker. She resigned from the attorney, or she made a decision not to run again for the attorney general's office. Because she didn't want it to be that by her father being the speaker, and she were to get elected to governor, she felt like that would have gave, create a, a trust factor. Which the governor today, he has the trust factor. Let me hit 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 Lisa again, right quick. Can you can you bring it down, son? I want I want to get the storyline. Right there, right there. It says. With the father out of Springfield, political climate is right for former powerful AG, Attorney General, to pursue her dream. But will she challenge J.B. Prisker for the state top job? That's a good question. The reason people are asking that question is because the governor, who I support, and who I helped elect, I carry them on my back, but they say, it's because I thought, and I convinced others that he was a man of his word. But his actions speak louder than words. What you mean by that, Gaynor? The seniors in the nursing homes and the residents in the nursing homes that had got affected with that COVID disease and some had died from the COVID disease are upset because he refused to enforce a law that's on the books called the Nursing Home Care Act, Section 8, against the nursing homes that he know and his administration know weren't in compliance, especially the nursing home at Sava Westchester. We're going to talk about that. But I'm going to tell you this. It says two years after leaving a shared legacy in Springfield, a storied legacy in Springfield, Lisa Mannequin's powerful name and clean reputation, powerful name and clean reputation, powerful statement, as a smart, tough, uncompromising prosecutor, still resonates with residents across Illinois, including black folks. When they see that this governor After getting the state house and state senate put a bill together to create the cannabis bill to make sure that those that they were giving the pardons to, they had former marijuana cases, gave them all pardons so that they, when they legalized the cannabis, would have a chance to work in there or be a part of having a dispensary for the cannabis. To this day, not a one. To this day, the only individuals are capitalizing off of it are white men. 
to the tune of over a billion dollars. For the nursing homes, he refused to enforce that law. And then he put an executive order together to make it where the bad nursing homes can be held liable. Then in 20, what is it, 19 or 2018, he gave them over $200 million, bad nursing homes. Now they're saying that this governor, from what I'm reading, The same thing that was happening with the governor in New York when it came to the nursing homes and uh, the data that they was given, it downplayed how many people really were being infected or died in the nursing home. That same thing is now happening with J.B. Prescott. We're going to get in that. But I'm going to get away from this right quick. I know Lisa. Good woman. Rare minded individual. Go get her for the residents of Illinois. She's known as a. I'll tell you this if she was the Attorney General, she wouldn't have waited for J.B. Prisca to enforce that law because by him not enforcing that law it made it where Attorney General Kwame Raul and Cook County State's Attorney and all the other County State's Attorneys their hands were tied where they couldn't go in and investigate the wrongs that were happening in the nursing home. That's what J.B. Prescott did. That's what people are paying attention to. That's why you see the story. And the Chicago Crusader newspaper. They're not Republicans. They're not Trumpites. They just know what this government is doing that's wrong to the African-American community for sure. It's up to Lisa to make decisions on what she wants to do. Then it'd be up to the, but it's going to always be up to the voters. But people are of the opinion of elected officials that's in the office, be they state senators, state reps, African American, black or Hispanic, or Asian. Man or woman, if you're in the office, they're judging you on your accountability before you come back to the communities and say that you're electable. Show me where you were accountable. Show me what you did before you come back and try to convince me that you're electable. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Omari, oh let's move on to... The Joliet piece about the job. Yeah. Editorial. From Chicago Tribune, a Joliet project could jumpstart Illinois' COVID recovery. Why does the state say no? When they say the state, they're talking about the governor. You got, let me see, two United States senators, Doug Worth and Durbin. You got Congressman Bobby Rush. 
You got what the congressman name? I don't want to chop his name up, but he's the only one that voted that said Republican, Illinois congressman, that said that Trump need to be impeached. And you have the new state Democratic Party chairman, Congresswoman Robin Kelly, that says that they're asking the governor to build a bridge over this town where this company is talking about paying for it to have it done in order to create 10,000 jobs for the Southland of Cook County, Father Kankakee, Will County, that's bringing 10,000 jobs to Illinois. And he refused to do that because he have authority over that by telling the Illinois Department of Transportation to do whatever has to be done. So what is he saying? If he need money from the federal government to make it happen, he got the support of both of the United States senators that represent Illinois. If you need infrastructure money that's coming and they're going to vote on that next, talking about bringing the bacon home. Three congressmen talking about bringing the bacon home and he refused to sign it or get it done. That's another reason that people are saying and wishing and praying A suggestion or suggesting, man, wish Lisa run. Wish somebody run against my wish. Not because of what Gator said, not because of what he didn't do with Gator. Because of what he's not doing for the residents of Illinois. I can say all this. Because I support him. And I'm accountable to the people who I convinced to vote for him. Let's show this right here. This picture right here. Brother Amari. Picture with me, Jesse White, and J.B. Prescott. Helping him to win. It says left to right, Illinois Secretary of State, Jesse White. Illinois Governor, J.B. Prisca. Wallace Gator Bradley, the urban translator. And the best is Gator, the urban translator, and his history, community activist and social justice warrior for the people. I say to God be the glory. Let's see the, let's see the next picture, Brother Amari. This picture right here someone sent to me, okay? And one of those Facebook memories. And he say, I should have been here today. That was the day that J.B. Prisca started his tour saying he was sorry about the phone call he had with Pogorovich. When Pogorovich was trying to sell or the seat, send his seat that Barack Obama had before he became president. And it was a phone conversation where J.B. Prescott said at the time, that the least, how you say it, and, and I'm going to give you my, my paraphrase. The least 
the one person that everybody don't have no problem with is Jesse White. And he was right. Everybody loved Jesse. But Jesse didn't want to be no senator. He didn't want to be no governor. He didn't want to be no mayor. He was happy with serving the people as the Secretary of State. That's why the last election he got 3 million votes. But the fact of the matter is this. We refuse to let individuals try to create something saying that J.B. Prisker did Jesse White wrong by stating that. And he didn't. But we stood up with him because we felt he was better than Ronald. And he was. And he is. But he ain't doing right for the citizens and the residents of Illinois. Me, Walter Burnett, Jesse White, others, Pat Dow, Sawyer, other elected officials, stood with him. And a lot of them couldn't even get a phone call back from him. Take my word for it. Ask them. Fast forward. Let's see the other picture. Brother Amari. Where I'm asking the governor now to please enforce the Nursing Home Care Act, Section 8. Save our seniors. To God be the glory. So they say, Gator, what do you want? I want him to make sure those 10,000 jobs come to Illinois. I want him to enforce that nursing home care act against them bad nursing homes. I want him to find a way to make it where African Americans get their fair share. Of that cannabis law. Ain't no job from you. Because if you were to hire me. Or if you were to ask me what I want. I want to be the bridge to make sure that you do what you're supposed to do. For the residents of Illinois. Especially African American community. Don't just be a governor. Be a good governor. And people won't, won't be whispering or praying that someone else come and vote against you. I'm going to move on with that one. I'm going to come to something that's very important because I'm about to close out. And that's about the piece that's dealing with the McDonald's. Corporate systemic racism. Yeah, that's it right there where it says Pastor Donald uh, Johnson makes reference. In our audience today, we have with us President, to this. Mr. Jim Bird, Mr. Daryl Bird, uh, Daryl's uh, family, and Mr. Nash. The Bird brothers are my friends, my real friends. These brothers are franchise of owners tour. of McDonald's who along with 70 other owners are part of a class action lawsuit that accused the corporation, the corporation McDonald's of intentionally steering black owners to economically disadvantaged areas and then ultimately classifying those stores as having no value. In the last 25 years, the amount of black franchise owners has decreased by 51%. It went from 377 in the late 90s to now only 186 as of now. And so the request in the lawsuit is, is fairly simple. Economic equality. Treat blacks the same as their white counterparts. Are y'all with me? 
black owners average and earn three quarters of a million dollars less per store than their other franchise or their white contemporaries. These owners are standing up for black owners that remain with the corporation and letting McDonald's know that they cannot continue to ignore anti-black practices. Are y'all with me? Jim Bird, Daryl Bird, Brother Nash, would you guys stand? I met the Bird brothers when the Grizzlies first came to Memphis over 20 years ago and we have been friends, not just french fry friends we have been friends and brothers over the last 20 years and these guys own mcdonald's they're not managers at mcdonald's they own mcdonald's carrierville cordova where else arlington somerville these guys own these are black brothers that own mcdonald's and I know growing up, McDonald's was our favorite kind of place. They served us. Okay. So what we've come to realize is that, you know, as much as we love McDonald's and all of our children have gone there to get a happy meal and, you know, we got the chicken nuggets and the mac rib and, you know, we, we've had the... Uh, uh, the milkshake. So we, we've enjoyed McDonald's, but we can no longer stand by and let them mistreat our people when we have owners, owners. <laughs> and this is not somebody that's just disgruntled about McDonald's and they want two extra Big Macs and two all beef patties and special sauce lettuce. Cheese. This is not about that. These are some brothers that have said, listen, the, the records show this. The records show this. In fact, Jesse Jackson, one of our former baseball players, uh, stood with them. In fact, one of the former baseball players is a part of this lawsuit to say to McDonald's, you're not going to keep treating us this way. You're not going to keep doing that. And so I made up in my mind, now you all can do what you want to do. I'm just telling you, I'm not eating another fry, another fish, a uh, filet of fish, another cheeseburger, another double cheeseburger. Y'all pray for a brother. I'm not eating another Mac rib, drinking another Coke until they make some changes concerning our people. I'm a part of a coalition. I'm a part of a coalition of African American pastors uh, in our city, not just Baptists, but it's just pastors all over our city. And um, but I wanted to make sure that I made it plain that I stand with them. That, listen, I don't get anything out of this except an effort to turn this thing around. And the Bible says, strike the iron while the fire is hot. So while this movement is taking place, we have to unearth some mistreatment that has gone on for too long concerning our people. Our money spends just like everybody else. Our ice is just as cold. Our water is just as wet. And our feelings matter. Our feelings matter. I would, Oak Grove, if you would, just for a moment, I want you to receive my friend and brother, Brother Jim. Who's going to have some words? Brother Jim? I just want them to come up, and I want them to have, I, you all know I normally don't do this. I normally don't do this, but listen, y'all, this is not a political movement. Nobody's running for office here, okay? We're not trying to get Congress or, 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 or city council or anything of that nature, but I want, I, I think the church... We have the platform, we have the mic, and Oak Grove, nobody can worship like us, but we also have to address the, uh, the unfair treatment of our people. Are y'all with me? We have to address that. And I celebrate these guys, and they can't go into all of that. But, but I'm not a part of the lawsuit. I'm a supporter. But we've had some brothers that, that were, uh, you know, minority owners. They were black owners. But because of the fear and the pressure, some of those guys backed out. Because it takes a lot to go up against a multi-billion dollar corporation like McDonald's and say you're wrong for mistreating us. So I celebrate these guys for taking a stand for what is right and coming up against the mistreatment of our people amen now this is not about so I want to make it clear this is not about Oak Grove giving money to this uh, a lawsuit or anything of that nature I want to make it clear because you know how people can be right I just want to make it clear that we as a church we as a church <coughs> in fact 
the betterment of our people a lot of that started in the church and in the home of the black people and the church we have to make sure that we don't stay commercial and and forget that our people while we want them in here to jump and shout we got people that are being mistreated in the stores that we attend come on walmart is in, is in the same y'all not saying nothing target the same way you go there and see that they have caucasians that are in higher positions and we are just as educated just as smart just as intelligent we like jg wetworth it's our money and we want it now y'all don't watch commercials y'all just watch the broadcast don't you listen they can't i know they can't be long again and i know you know this is not my norm in fact i originally wasn't going to do it but i really feel led to let these brothers just have just a word just just a word to just speak to the plight and the problems and the practices of what's going on receive the bird brothers just uh real briefly thank you so much for this wonderful church. Um, I didn't know exactly what I was going to say today because it's heartfelt. We have to take a moment as a 31-year McDonald operator and stand up against something you're part of. If not now, when? If not now, when? And I promise you I'll be brief, but there was a Black Lives Matter march here in Memphis that I had a chance to participate in. I went to Louisville, Kentucky, and Breonna Taylor had a little march that, that my brother and I had a chance to participate in. And one thing I saw was there weren't a lot of old heads like us out there. I saw young people trying to do something that was right. Then, two executives filed a lawsuit in February, and a lot of the information started to come out. And you started to see that there were white operators are making more money, black operators dwindled from 377 down to 180, cash flow, is $900,000 difference or sales. The region I'm in, each store you make $140,000 less. If not now, when? So as an old head, we started looking around and we put together what they said couldn't be done. 77 black operators across the country sued McDonald's. Okay. And then my brother and I did a class action lawsuit for the current McDonald's. And I'm gonna end my little piece by saying, I didn't know what I was gonna say when I was asked to speak and stood up here. But that first song, woo! <laughs> the young folks, the young folks deserve what we're doing. If not now, when? And I'm standing, and I'm standing strong. Thank you. Thank you, man. Thank you, thank you, Jim. Thank you, Pastor. And I'll be brief. My name is Daryl Bird. I'm the little brother. Uh, my brother and I, we go back, man, we've been best friends since we were kids. Even we, when we used to fight, my parents would make us, we'd have to hug each other and, and give a kiss on each other's cheek. I hated it, but they said, you, you two are going to have to stay together for the rest of your lives. You have to carry this family. And we just started as kids. We're still here today. We were in trouble then, but we're causing good trouble now. I want to tell you, that we have a situation going on. And, you know, there's no better city than to do it in, than Memphis because I found my life in Memphis. I came from Detroit, and I was a lost man until I met a woman here in Memphis. And I found the church in Memphis, and I found my soul. I came from a homeless guy, basically, to a guy that owned a McDonald's restaurant, a story that I never have told until today. But I was led by these young kids, these young people, these young people that look just like me, that they said, stand up. And, you know, we keep getting asked this question, why? Why would two guys that are still in the system fight McDonald's when at any time they can come and basically destroy you? And, I, and, and you know, this morning I found my, my real answer that I will always say to the media from now on. I found my answer here at Oak Grove because these young people told me to stand up. And I will stand up for what's right. I will stand up for justice for black people. 
I know that they can't do anything to me because I got the Father with me. So even though you see me, you see that you don't see these people in front of you. You don't see God and all these angels surrounding us. So I'm not worried. I'm not fearful. That's why this movement has to start in Memphis. We've got 77 African-American men and women that should be in the retirement, living good part of their life like all of our white counterparts. All these people, all 77, I'm going to tear the myth off. They're all struggling. So we leave, we look good, you got the car and everything, and when you go to retire, you can't sell your store because it's not worth anything because they charge you more. They charge me higher, I'll make it plain. If you had a house, we both have a house. We buy a million dollar house. I'm black, you're white. Both have the same banker. We both get approved for the loan. We go in to sign our papers. Your loan is at 3% for your million dollar house. You're happy as you can be, sign your papers, you close, you got a house. I go into the banker. I'm happy as can be. He charges me 9%. I'm happy as can be because I got my house and everything. I don't even know he's paying 3%. And so when it comes time for me to sell my house, I don't have anything to sell. And then what do they do? They come and snatch it from us. So instead of us having retirement, we're out driving trucks, looking for jobs. That's not going to happen anymore as long as I'm living. I'm going to stand up for what's right. I'm standing up for those little girls right there. Aaron and Tori, those are my baby girls. I've got 24, 25, 26-year-old girls and a 37-year-old son. And if I don't stand up, what am I telling them? Stand up for what's right. Stand up for the Lord. Never give up. But we need your support. We need you to tell your friends. They don't want us to talk. They've been trying to muzzle us. It's been really, really, really tough. But we said, I'm not, I'm not going to be quiet. If I'm quiet, I'm just, they got me beaten down like a slave. And my father is the master. So I don't have to be beat down for anybody. I got help here. I'm going to leave it alone. But please be with us and stand with us. Stand with us. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Thank you, Pastor Johnson. You, uh, First Lady Johnson, congregation and members of uh, Oak Grove. Um, I told them when we started this fight uh, in February that we needed to come to the black church because the greatest voice in the black community One is the black church. And from the church is from whence we all came and which we all will return. And we knew that Ephesians 6 and 12 says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but powers and principalities in spiritual weakness in high places. So this, this, this racism, this is an evil spirit. And so we got to pray f to overcome this. The victory is ours. All we got to do is pray. We took the faith and stepped out, and now we're, we're in the battle. And so we wanted to let y'all know that we are asking y'all to stand with us. Right. And we appreciate everything that y'all will be doing for us. And we will be back to Old Grove to let Old Grove know that we have won the victory and what the, the, the out, everything we need. So thank y'all. Thank you, Pastor Johnson. Well, listen, before these brothers go, I want you to, I want us to pray for these guys. The Bird Brothers, man, I love their mother. Their mother loves me. I praise God. I'm a part of their family. Um, they just lost a sister this week. You know, I wanted to leave on that to let you know that all things are possible through God. And we say, don't be Mac food. And I say, to God be the glory. That's our story. And hey, I got my shots. Get yours. But still, wash up and cover up. Have a nice evening.